think it fanciful to even envisage a world where we could actually prevent war. You might think it a bit the work of a dreamer to imagine that you could apply something very tangible and practical like a business plan to the issue of conflict prevention. Um, and I'd like to set out for you this afternoon why I think that's a false assumption. Um, for 40 years, I worked at the sharp end of armed violence in civil wars in Africa, Middle East, and so on. <clears throat> and then I got really interested in the threat of nuclear weapons. And I became curious about who makes nuclear weapons, who makes the decisions about them, who plans the strategy, and how does the whole system work? So I set up the Oxford Research Group in 1982 to do just that. And we mapped how the departments of intelligence inform what needs to be the next weapon strategically, how the physics departments in Lawrence Livermore, Oldham Austin in our case, uh, set about designing the warheads necessary, the military who strategize with the weapons, the corporations who build the platforms for the weapons, the submarines and the aircraft, the missiles, um, the people who sign the checks, and ultimately the politicians who have the onerous job of deciding whether or not to deploy them. And we wrote a book called How Nuclear Weapons Decisions Are Made. And the next decision we made was to find out if we could actually bring those people together to talk to each other. People from the then Soviet Union, the United States, Britain, France, and China. This was in the mid 80s, build up of the Cold War. And everybody said, you're mad. And indeed, we made a lot of mistakes. But gradually and slowly, we engaged their confidence we invited them to meet their opposite numbers from other countries and their informed critics, namely people who had left the business and knew enough to be able to have an informed discussion and dialogue. And what we were asking them to do was to listen to each other. And this was unfamiliar for many people. And it took, um, it took years to really learn how to do this, because it's very difficult to create a safe enough environment so that people feel that they can actually take off their jackets, roll up their sleeves, and see what could be some practical steps that they could take. So here's a picture of us taking British and American senior military and physicists to China where we were invited right into the middle of the Chinese nuclear weapons facilities. I couldn't believe what happened when we got to China. That was the second time. We've now been there seven times, leading delegations, or they have brought delegations to Oxford, to London, to Geneva, to Moscow, and so on. And um, after doing this work for 21 years, um, I handed it over to people who were much more competent than I because I had a hunch that something else was going on in the world. And that was that right at the other end of the spectrum of armed violence, people locally, in local conflict situations, were taking their lives in their hands to do something about the violence that was mounting. So I asked a researcher to go out and find out how many there were, competent, effective, organized groups uh, all over the world who were doing this. And he was able to identify 350 that were viable. 16 years later, we did the same exercise, and that number had escalated from 350 to 1,650. So a five um, times increase in the number of people acting locally. So let me give you an example of what we're talking about. Gululai Ismail, here she is, lives in northwest Pakistan, probably the most dangerous place in the world for a woman. 
And she started when she was 15 to get young girls into school. And her colleague, Malala Yousafzai, got shot in the head, as you remember, for doing just that. Totally undeterred, this young woman is fearless. She started a program to teach uh, groups of young people, women and men, to go into the madrasas, to identify the young men who are being trained for jihad, to go home with them to their families and discuss why the Quran would not approve of suicide bombing. And they have so far prevented 203 people from taking on a suicide bombing mission. So here she is with her teams of trained young people. So that's the kind of courage we're talking about. And it's not just somebody like Gululai. It exists now all over the world, literally in conflict areas all over the world. So um, after these three or four decades, I've got a fair idea of what war costs. I've got a fair idea of whose interest war serves. Um, and I've got a fair idea of why war continues. So the next question I ask myself is, how can war be stopped? Because just now we were hearing about preventive medicine and how much more effective and how cheaper that is. So I'm just going to try and demonstrate to you what our figures show about how war prevention makes financial sense. We know enough about war, what works in preventing war and what it costs that I was really surprised that nobody had done a business plan about it. Do a business plan about everything else, but we hadn't done a business plan about peace. So I wrote a book that was published six months ago. And um, in it, it had 25 of these systems that actually work that could be scaled up over a period of 10 years. And whereas, if we look at the figures, currently militarization worldwide, I don't know if you can read the figures in red at the top, is, is costing us all $1,686 billion a year, whereas 30 billion would wipe out starvation worldwide and 11 billion would provide clean water for every person on Earth. And the figures in my book show that if we were to scale up these 25 systems, and I'll tell you what some of them are in a moment, um, over a period of 10 years, that would cost $2 billion, whereas we spend $9 billion a year on ice cream. Um, so uh, let me give you an example of what one of those systems is. It's the one that Mandela proposed and used when he came out of jail in 1989. Because he knew that there was a huge likelihood of civil war breaking out because huge offers of armaments to the ANC and a lot of people wanting to fight it out with the then weakening Afrikaner government. And Mandela was able to not only persuade his colleagues to come along with him down the dialogue route, but he was also able to set up a system nationwide they had a national peace council, a regional peace council, city peace councils, town peace councils, and village peace councils. And the people on those councils were the ones people respected. And what their job was to make a peace plan for their area so that when violence was mounting up, they would rush this peace plan into action. And that actually prevented civil war in South Africa. I lived there for 10 years. So I know how all of us were frightened that if there was civil war, it would be huge, probably about six million people dying. So um, the book came out in September last year. And I've been, I thought that would be that, you know, written a book, that's enough. I've been amazed at the response. People have come forward to say to me that they wanted to support or uh, give their skills to or give some other kind of participation partnership in nine of these 25 initiatives. So let me just um, 
go forward. Um, told you about that and the nine billion on ice cream. So here are these strategies that um, people are offering their skills for. One would be a united corporate community, because I think we're all rather um, feeling that the United Nations isn't able to solve problems like Syria. And we believe that corporates now have such a much more multinational reach than nations that it may be that corporate, so we're getting 10 leading corporations together it, to use their power and their intelligence on some of the initiatives we're suggesting. Secondly, a social architecture for peace, like the one I described that Mandela set up. There are countries like Kenya and Ghana and other more war-infested countries who want to set that up. It costs about two and a half million per year to set one of those up. Then leading a program for divestment in weapons production. We know that the money to be made out of producing and selling and trading weapons is vast. And also the confusion of war enables drug dealers, money lenders, money launderers, and people traffickers to make huge amounts of money in the chaos. So that divestment is becoming very interesting now. Fourthly, women breaking the cycle of violence. We found that when there are only 2.5%, which was the average until two years ago, of women sitting around peace tables to negotiate a peace agreement, those agreements only last on average five years. When it comes up to 10% even of women, those agreements last up to 15 or 20 years. And the reason is, that the women present at the table represent the children, the afflicted, the injured, and the bereaved, and bring their concerns to the table, which then get dealt with in the peace agreement. Um, then we are funding 1,500 locally-led peace-building initiatives, because um, we know how effective, what incredible results those initiatives are uh, bringing out. Trauma counselling for different cultures. We know children who've survived Syria need trauma counselling. And then if you're familiar with the Global Peace Index, you'll know that the top 10 countries, usually the Nordics, are in a very good position to assist the bottom countries, the Syrias, the Yemens, the Somalias, to um, bring back the rule of law, to get into a state where they got a justice system going again. All those things that the top 10 countries can and are apparently willing to do. Uh, and then getting every member of NATO to establish in their government accounts a conflict prevention fund. Britain has one, but it's very small. It's about 2%. It's actually much less than that. It's 0.8% of our defense budget. Um, and lastly, securing the kind of funding that we need, myself and my colleagues and my team, to buckle on our belts and get on with organizing all this. Because it's, 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 I, I wanted to stop and retire and do nothing. And I don't seem to be able to do that. Um, and now I just want to talk a little bit about the skills that are necessary to do this. Um, I had the great good fortune to work with this man, who makes me laugh more than anybody I know, um, and Nelson Mandela in getting, putting together the wonderful plan of the elders. And I had the opportunity to sit in a room when Nelson Mandela began to speak to about 60 people. And he's not an orator. He's got a raspy voice. He doesn't use oratorical flourishes. But I got goosebumps when he started to speak. When he finished speaking, 30 minutes later, I still had goosebumps. And I asked myself, what is that? What's going on? And eventually, I detected what it was. It was the physical energy of his integrity. I was getting a visical, visceral hit from that man's integrity. You couldn't push him over, you couldn't bribe him, you couldn't corrupt him. He was going for what was necessary for truth and reconciliation in his country and in the world. Now, that's one of the qualities that are needed for
for this kind of work. And the second, of course, is courage. And I'd love to tell you stories of the courage that people use in this kind of work if we had time. Um, but to um, the, just to go on a little bit about the skills that we need, a, a lot of people come to me and say, but what can I do? You know, they, this is all things that people at um, national levels or in civil wars need to do. What can I do? Because they, there's a lot of disruption at home and in the workplace and in the community. So we've now developed a program that can teach the skills that people need to uh, prevent and resolve conflict at home. Um, and I'll, uh, one of those is actually learning to listen. And I wish I could, I wish we had 20 minutes and I could ask you all to do an exercise to check whether you're a good listener or not, because 90% of us are not. And good listening, you remember Senator Mitchell when he came over and eventually um, managed to construct the Good Friday Agreement? And he said when he arrived, I will listen for as long as it takes. And he did, and it worked. So there are skills that children can learn in primary school. Um, the Dalai Lama said, if every child learned to meditate for five minutes a day even, there would be no war in 30 years because we would learn the value of self-knowledge, self-inspection, calmness, and quietness. And that's, that's the man. And I'd just like to conclude, if I may, by saying that when kids ask me, a lot of kids are very disturbed at the amount of violence they perceive around them and the way that the world seems to be in a terrible state. And they say to me, what can I do? And so I say, what breaks your heart? Because that's where the passion is, and that's where the energy is. And they tell me, you know, it could be child refugees, it could be wounded animals, whatever. I say, great. What are your skills? Are you good at social media? Can you get a group of friends together? Are you good at communicating? Are you good at crowdfunding? And they tell me what their skill is. And I say, right, match your skill with your passion. And then gather your friends around. And in two years, instead of being anxious and troubled, you'll be full of joy. Because, as somebody said earlier, doing this work and being in service gives us the kind of joy that Desmond Tutu walks around with all the time. So, um, along with my thousands of colleagues all over the world, I'm doing what we teach people to do, which is to take a stand for what you believe in. So I'm here to say to you now that I am certain that at this point in human history, we not only have the skills we need, we have the knowledge that we need, but it's also essential for the future of humanity that we put an end to armed conflict. Thank you.